On today's episode, we have a complete breakdown of the brand new Rapala Crush City Soft Plastics with the man himself, Jacob Wheeler. So these five brand new baits from Rapala, the Mayor, the Cleanup Craw, the Freeloader, the Bronco Bug, and the Ned BLT were all designed by Jacob himself. So in the spirit of Tackle Talk, we take a deep dive into each of these individual baits with Jacob to learn about why certain design elements were chosen, how they were developed, and how they were intended to be used. All that and more in this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now... Here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey everybody, welcome back to another very special episode of the Tackle Talk podcast, which we will get to in just a second. But first, as always, we are brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors. And ironically enough, American Legacy was one of Jacob's very early sponsors in his career. And although a lot has changed in the fishing industry since then, American Legacy Fishing has not. They're still the same down-to-earth Midwestern tackle shop with a fantastic selection of both new and used fishing gear, including rods, reels. They have an ever-expanding line of baits. Almost anything you can need, you can find at ALF. They have the best customer service that I've ever experienced in the fishing industry. They have fast shipping, and they have my favorite reward system of any tackle site. But if that wasn't enough for you, right now they're running their trade-a-thon through the end of January, which means that right now you can get an extra 10 to 15 percent on your trade in now through January 31st. That means if you are going to trade in a rod that was worth $100, boom, it's now 110 to 115. If your reel was worth $150, now it's worth 165 to 170. Free money just for trading in your gear right now in the month of January. So it's extremely simple. You fill out the form online, a few quick questions, and then you get a quote sent to your email for your gear. And if you like it, you send ALF your gear, they send you a gift card. It's that easy. So you can head over to www.americanlegacyfishing.com to take part in their January trade-a-thon right now. And as always, if what you're looking for is not on sale, it is now because you can use code TACKLETALK10 at checkout to save 10% off almost everything on the website over at www.americanlegacyfishing.com. All right, folks, before we get into the episode today, I just want to let you guys know, too, we don't normally have this as an option, but if you would rather watch this interview with all of the visuals and both of us talking and kind of showing baits and pictures and things like that, you can actually go over to our YouTube channel because as of this morning, the same time this episode went live on your podcast formats, I actually released the YouTube video of the conversation with Jacob. So we have the full thing on YouTube, a full hour plus with actual visuals, and you get to see us talking versus just the mp3 we don't do that very often i am going to try and do that a little bit more this year for special occasions like this obviously not normal episodes but if we do have a special guest or something that i think would be important for you guys to see i am going to try and do a little bit more video so if you'd rather watch it on youtube it's available on our youtube channel just search tackle talk podcast you'll find us pop up click the new episode with jacob wheeler and you'll be able to watch it there in addition to listening but today folks we have a very special episode that i've wanted to do probably since july maybe august of last year, but I wanted to wait till the right time to do it. So today we are joined by the one and only Jacob Wheeler, quite possibly the most dominant angler on the planet for the past five or 10 years to talk about the brand new Rapala Crush City Customs soft plastics that Jacob himself designed for Rapala. So a quick backstory here, this past year at ICAST down in Orlando, as you walk around this like massive convention center where there's like every piece of tackle under the sun that you can imagine, I would say on a normal year, probably Probably 70 to 80% of that gear is tackle that's already out on shelves, and it's just these brands kind of showing off to potential dealers that are walking around that, hey, you know, we have this stuff, you should carry it. And then the other 20 to maybe 30% is actual new gear that brands are trying to get those dealers to carry in addition to their current line of products. So a lot of the ICAST stuff is just kind of a big peacock strut for different brands as they pour a bunch of money into these booths and these displays, and they're hoping to garner attention from retailers and from media. 
But this past year at iCast, I would say one of the displays and the boost that the media and the buyers were flocking to more than anything else was Rapala. And it was nonstop. And it was because when you looked around the show floor, yeah, maybe brand X comes out with a few new colors or brand Y comes out with some new variation of a reel that's already on the market. Well, Rapala was actually doing something seemingly for the first time, at least under the Rapala name, and that was introducing a line of soft plastics. And yes, Rapala owns Storm, and Storm has had some soft plastics, and we'll get to that in the episode, but under the Rapala name, arguably one of the most prestigious names in all of bass fishing tackle, you can walk down the aisle of your local tackle shop and see Rapala jerk baits, crank baits, top waters, other hard baits, but you won't see Rapala soft plastics, and that is until now. So not only did they launch these soft plastics, but they did it in partnership with a guy whose star power and success on the tournament trail can't be denied in Jacob Wheeler. So they actually had Jacob lead the design of these Crush City baits, and when you tie in a giant in the tackle industry like Rapala with a giant on the tournament side like Jacob Wheeler, and then you consider it something that Rapala really hasn't done before now, you have something that people should probably at least pay attention to. So it was a big deal at the time. And after really looking hard at those five soft plastics that they launched at iCast, and from what I know about Jacob, obviously, as a person, getting to know him over the past couple years, I know that a lot of work went into these baits. And especially in a world where the entire fishing community is so dang cynical now, and everyone just sits there and screams, oh, that looks like... X or that's just a copy of blank, right? Insert whatever you want there. I wanted to really do a deep dive into these baits and the guy behind the baits to take a hard look at the little design elements that make these baits unique. And then from the other side, I've actually got a chance to fish these baits over the past few weeks. And so I've got to come to my own conclusions about where they shine, what they do well. And I wanted to wait until I had some firsthand experience with these baits before we did an episode like this. And then the final element of this was waiting until they actually go on sale and they're available. Because in my opinion, it doesn't really do a whole lot of good to have an episode like this with someone like Jacob back in July or August. Yes, maybe that was when everybody was talking about them and they were like the hot new thing or whatever, but you at home can't buy them. So I would much rather wait until they're on your store shelves and you listen to this episode and you go, you know what? Those do sound cool. I do want to pick those up. If we would have done this in July, you can't do that. You just sit there and go, well, that was really cool, but I can't can't buy them for another six months, so I don't know what the point of that was. So I wanted to wait until they're actually on store shelves before we had this conversation, and then you can decide if you want to try these new baits out. So without further ado here, we're going to jump right into our full breakdown of the Rapala Crush City Custom Soft Plastics with Major League Fishing Pro and now lure designer Jacob Wheeler. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we are joined by a very special guest. We are joined by the mayor of Crush City, our buddy, Mr. (laughs) Jacob Wheeler. Jacob, thanks so much for coming back on Tackle Talk. Man, I always enjoy it, man. I appreciate you having me on. So this one's exciting because today, obviously, we've had you on before, but we actually get to talk nitty gritty tackle stuff today. And specifically, your own tackle you just came out with, with Rapala with the Crush City Customs lineup. So I know we've previewed it, like we got to talk to you for a minute at iCast, but I'll tell you, man, I don't know how you function at iCast because I watched them run your boy ragged over here for probably (laughs) 30 minutes. You probably did 10 media hits in 30 minutes, and I know it's three days of that. So today, I think we'd really like to sit down and kind of break down these five baits individually and do a little bit more of a deep dive on them, if you're cool with that. Absolutely, man. I, I mean, I absolutely, man. It's, it was a, it's definitely been a, 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 it was a challenge. It was a lot of fun. And it was like, I learned things that I never thought. Like, I, I, I've always thought baits did a certain thing. And there were certain baits that I liked. And I'm like, why is that fit, that catch fish? And then I'm like, now with like a test tank and a pool and all these things like there's so many things that we just don't realize as fishermen and the amount of work i'm sure that goes into like not just one bait i mean you came out with a line you came out with five baits so each of these kind of i'm assuming has its own nuances of perfecting it and getting it right where i mean you're dealing with multiple types of plastic you know you got swim baits you got craws you got neds so i guess as far as like the rapala crush city lineup like as a whole how does this thing start out like is this rapala coming to you and saying hey i know we're obviously in like the hard bait category for the most part but we're dipping our toes in soft plastics and you know we'd obviously love your input on these or is it the flip side of you go to Rapala and say, hey, I got some ideas. I'd kind of like help bring them to life. Like, how did this whole thing start? So, like, um, 
you know, sort of backstory on Rapple and myself, like Rapple, like I probably wouldn't be fishing professionally without Rapple. Like, you know, I, I started, um, after, well, a- they gave me a big shot. And, um, after I won the all American, they, um, they had, they said, Hey, look, we want you to bring you on the staff. Um, and they were one of my first paying sponsors. I, you know, I mean, there were a handful of paying sponsors, you know, going into the next year, the FLW tour. So natural progression, um, later on, they were like, Hey, look, you know, things have been really, really good. Fishing has been unbelievable and competing and, 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 you know, winning a lot of tournaments and having really high finishes. And I, you know, really close to that whole crew there. Um, they're like family to me. And so one of the guys, you know, came to me and said, look, man, um, I, I know, you know, at that point in time, I was with Guggen Bates and it was sort of like the end of the contract year. And they were like, look, we are going to make these new soft plastics, but we want you to be, to make them. And like, you'll have two years to develop what you want. You'll, I, we just want you to develop the best five. The first five baits need to be five soft plastics that you need to win tournaments. And so like, think like this is going to be a lot of fun. We're all friends here. I mean, like it, like it was just sort of like a match made in heaven. It was a perfect scenario. Like here you go. And so that was a lot. Like when you just have like a blank slate, you know, I, you know, it was, it was a tough decision, but like, obviously with the partnership I've had with them for so long to be able to work with some of those people that I've been, you know, working with for, for almost a decade, um, for over a decade now, it was like, it was a pretty simple decision. Like, Hey, look, we get a, go after it and, and, and get a, try to play around and, 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 and have some really cool stuff and bring some stuff out to the market. Um, so the goal was to me was like a four, first and foremost, f- five, eight, five shapes that you can do that you can make that you, you can you, use to win tournaments on the second thing from the biggest thing for me is like, I couldn't do another bait. That was like another me too. There has to be something that was like better. And, and so it's like hard in certain shapes to like do something like always, but like my goal, like you know, you're, you're not always going to make the sweet beaver. You're not going to always make, um, the structure bug or, um, based like that, you know, you're just, it's not always going to happen, but my goal is to make something at least 20 or 30% better than what the competition is out there to ultimately make it more efficient, which helps me win more tournaments. And that was sort of like the start of it all. Um, and so that's when I came up with five shapes and it was like a swim bait, uh, a net style bait. Um, cause I'm a big fan of like throwing a net on a drop shot and throwing it on a net. Um, just like, it, there's also like, uh, like, of course, like a freeloader, which was more so like mindset was vibrating jig. And then in addition to that was like, um, you know, shake and bake or a uh, BOA rig or like a Demiki style, a little bit bigger profile that was sort of fit both sides. Um, obviously a, a creature style bait and then a crawl. So that was sort of like the rundown, like mom on, like, that's what I need. A swim jig trailer, uh, you know, back of a jig trailer, uh, just with my self punching. Like I'm thinking through, like if I had five shapes, how can I make that work? And those were like the first five we rolled with. So it's interesting you bring up, cause this is the thing that absolutely drives me up a wall about the fishing industry in general now is everybody in the world immediately, as soon as they see something that even remotely looks like something they've seen before, they lose their darn mind now and it's going to be like a long five or ten years if we keep this up in fishing where every time you see something that looks even remotely like a shape you've seen before then we just absolutely pull our hair out like we've hit a point in fishing where what's able to be done that makes sense has been tried already like there's only so many ways you can make a shad there's only so many ways you can make a crawl there's only so many ways you can make a worm and so what we have to start doing at this point I think and this is like my big soapbox on this is like start looking at it micro versus macro because if you're looking at this and saying i want some earth shattering shape i've never seen before you're not going to get that but you have to start zooming in the days of you know a an earth shattering bait coming out every year are over you can make the argument the last earth shattering bait that came out is 
a chatterbait 20 years ago. Like, yeah. so we're past that. So now you have to look at a crawl and say, okay, where are the minute differences that make this different than the other 30 crawls on the market? And that's where I think the fun in new tackle lies now is putting them side by side and saying, hey, and we're going to talk about a lot of this. Like there are some small design choices that you made on each of these baits that are different than what's out there on the market, whether it's flanges, whether it's the appendages, whether it's the thickness, whether it's the body, you know, shape when you're looking head on or the durability. Like there's a lot of differences in these as I hold them up next to those things that people are like, that's a spunk shad. It's like, no, it's not a spunk shad. It doesn't look anything like a sp- Like I got them both right here. They're very yeah. different body types. So that's the kind of thing that drives me up a wall is, is you could say a BMW is a copy of a Toyota Corolla because it has <laughs> four wheels and windows and a hood and a trunk. And no, it's not like there's minor differences that make it worth 25,000 versus 60,000. So yes. I think that's where the fun in this is going to be is looking at these five baits and the small choices that are evident that you and Rapala made that I think do give these a spot in my tackle box that wasn't currently filled. So before we dive into that, though, you said two years. Is that what you said this process was or did it end up being longer than that? Yeah, it was about two years from the start. Well, it's two and a half. It was two and some change, but like it took time to figure out and there's a couple of things that i had to learn to scrap like you got to also realize like when on pd sides of things i had to learn a lot myself like i i tinker a lot but making a whole lot of soft plastics like from scratch is you know that's a that's a big task and, and especially with a reputable name like rapala and like how it's like an iconic brand um i didn't take that lightly you know and it, and so you're like, dang, you know, um, I wanted to do this. And some things you had to realize, like, you couldn't make this do this and that. Like, there had to be a, a, a middle ground. And so those were the things that, like, I had to figure out. And slowly but surely on the PD side, I understood. But, um, you know, we got we got it there. Was this by far the most invested you've ever been in a bait? Like, I know you've worked with, like, Accent and oh, stuff before on, on, you know, some wire baits and stuff. But this has to be a whole different ballgame. Like I approved every color. I approved how much salt content went in them. I approved where the salt went. I approved where the scent went. I approved the scent from this is what we're looking at for scents. I mean, like it's just, yeah, by far in a, like blows everything else away from as far as the PD standpoint of how much time and effort I put more time and effort into this series than I probably put into tournament bass fishing last, last couple of years. Um, I believe it. And that says a lot. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time on the water, but that's just, you know, that's how, um, how much time I put into it. So the answer to this next question will probably determine where we start in the five here, which of these took the longest to dial in, man. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to think here as far as you know what's so crazy about the longest one that actually took to, to dial in was actually the four inch mare. Really? And believe it or not, the swim bait. The swim bait was the one that I was like, nope, 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 and kept on going after it. Um it 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 literally took to the last revision in December of last year before we got it right. I think I probably know where you were going with the mayor because there's definitely some uh, Midwest influence in its motion. And I think you probably know where I'm going with that. But as far as like the mayor itself, when you sat out to develop more of like a boot tail style swim bait, like what did you want out of the mayor? So the first thing was like the like where I got the whole mindset of the mayor was so the Largo shad back in the day. Like this is like um, so like six years ago. Storm came out with a bait called a Largo Shad, which was made for salt water. Uh, it was made at that point in time. And so I'm sitting here and like, to me, like I look at the swim baits like Kytex and other swim baits on the market and everybody's just, you know, once the Kytex fat came out, everybody just ran into making Kytex fat. Like it was like, what? The? Like it was insane. It was like a 1.5 craze, like where RC came out, then it went to KBD, then it went to like the Excalibur. And it was like, you know, it was nuts. And so like, I, you know, swim, you know obviously a, a Kytex was still unbelievable, but I sort of was like, I saw that profile and I'm like, that is what a shad looks like. It has more depth, almost like a sashy shad. 
if yeah. you will. More depth to the body, more what like a four inch actual thread fin or gizzard shad looks like has more depth and is more like realistic to me than any other profile. So I went to Storm and I'm like, look, you know, this is like during Trigger X day or like actually the, the 360 GT days. And so they made that little swim bait and I'm like, Look, we got to make this thing softer. We got to make this thing in some bass colors. Like I'm telling you all, this will absolutely kill it. And so I worked with them hand in hand to develop the colors within the Largo Shad, which are now, you know, the three inch and the four inch Largo Shad. So I was a huge fan of that, which the three inch had a little bit more tighter action and the four inch had a little bit more wider action, similar to like a Kitek. So like, but they were super durable. You caught a ton. I mean, you could catch on the screw lock head, you could catch like 10, 15, 20 bass on a lot of times. So, I, but the only problem with the Largo was, is it wasn't a consistent action because of the dirt. But, you know, the, it was like, a, it wasn't always the best color for the material we're using. It was a good entry level swim bait. So like, that was really where it stemmed from was like Largo. My mindset, though, for the four-inch swim bait was I wanted that four-inch mare, I wanted it to really become, like, I I personally think that, and I've seen this, where fish, they react so differently to, like, a, a very wide, wobbling crankbait versus that shad wrap. Say a wiggle work versus a shad wrap, right? And so, like, when you think of, like, the swim bait, like, mindset of, like, where that's gone, you think of, like, bass tricks, you think of, like, fat high tech. And I think that it's consistently gone to where more subtle, more um, tighter wiggle. Um, like, and so that was where, like, all right, how can I make a good body roll, not too much, and then the tail not go, you know, you know, 10 to 2. I want it to be, like, as tight as I can get it, like, you know, from 11 to one almost to keep it here. Cause that's what a shad does. He doesn't sit there. And so I'm thinking like, that's where I wanted it. So it's like, that's where I was like super adamant. Like, Hey guys, we have to get this right. Like it can't go 10 to two. That's what every other swimmate does, but I want the body roll, but I want it to like kick. And so that's what it took so long to get that right. And because like you would, you would, change the tail and then you would adjust it and then it would be like you would get the tail action but then you wouldn't get enough body roll but then you would like so it was like that con like, like it's like that small body roll but then when that tail's doing that like together it's like that was it like it was finally right but that was really what i wanted with a four inch and that was what took me so long to find like it's pressure is just getting it's just getting more and more on a lot of our bodies of water and i feel like that's where you know Fish are reacting to that action better than the other ones now, the more aggressive actions consistently every single day, no matter what the weather conditions are, than they will, you know. So it's just sort of like that was my mindset with that one. Yeah, and I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong because you travel more than I do, but I think that's like a, it is a Midwest thing to think of a swim bait that's got a tight range of motion and almost the body roll is more important than the tail. Like around here, we've got a lot of small swim bait makers in like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and that's what you see. You see this really tight kind of like boot tail, you know, tail and you want some, especially for like cold water. It's like, you want that thing to just shimmy is really what it does. And like you said, nowadays, everybody's giant wagon tails back and forth. And it's like, that's not what we're looking for around here. And so it's cool to see that influence something that I think as Midwesterners, we've been hip to for usually we're like behind the times on a lot of things, I think, yeah, but I think yeah. we were a little ahead on that because like you said, the world's getting more pressured and you're now seeing, I mean, you saw it with Midwest finesse tactics, like Ned's and stuff too. It's like things that were working here by necessity are now branching out into the rest of the United States because it's getting harder and harder with the more pressure. So that's what I liked about this. When I threw it the first time, I was like, this is very like Ohio, Indiana, you know, Illinois to the bone. <laughs> yeah. um, but you mentioned, so this is one of the few things where you have multiple sizes that you had to deal with while you're yeah. designing. And I think a lot of people probably underestimate the difficulty of replicating actions in different size soft plastics. Like so it's not hard. as easy as saying, uh, oh, we, we made the four inch scale everything back 50%. Like that's not how it works. It's, it does not. And that, that's something that I had to learn. I mean, and I'm like, so the three inch has a little bit more of an aggressive action, but he has a little more thumb, but he's not too much. But he has a different action. So it's like, you know, each one of them has something a little bit. He's like, a, you know, a, 
eleven thirty to you know one thirty. You know, what I'm saying? Yeah. so he's like got a little bit more to him, but I couldn't get him to where. And a lot of that came down to like, yeah, you think you scale it down. A lot of that came down to like, okay, the power tells this motion, water comes through. I'm not an engineer, but like working with some of the best engineers in the business and being able to talk with them, they're like, I don't think we can do that. Maybe we can do that. I don't know. So like they're trying to figure it out. But then also like, I want it to be like, my whole thing is if I tell the consumer it does something and I tell somebody that's following me on, on social media and following me on YouTube or whatever, I want to be able to prove everything that I say it does with underwaters. I'm not going to say something that bait does not do. And I mean, I made it this way for a reason. And so that was something that was really important to me. So like having consistent action was really important. And so that was like, you know, you figure out that trade off once you get to the three inch size, how do I do that? You know, and that's, that was sort of the trade off there. So what's the deal with the like small little like fin thing off the tail. Like, is that purely aesthetic or is there a reason to that? Like, you know what I'm talking about? This real tiny little prick that's kind of off the so tail. So to me, that was more sort of like, I wanted, I wanted to figure out a way to make it more like shad profile, like tail wise, you know, like a little more like, but that was as big as I could make it without messing up the action. Like legitimately, I went smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it was like a little nub, and I'm like, "All right, I'm, I'm gonna roll with that." Like, I just like where it's at. It's like, I, I just again, I don't want it to be like everything else. So I'm like, I'm trying to like, okay, like even like the the hook slot with the little fin and and the like in that hook slot, like having that kind of stuff, just something a little bit more. I, I've realized over the last few years, I, I've learned more. I said this the other day. This is this is like facts. I've learned more in the last five years about fish and fish behavior with forward facing sonar than I knew my entire career, my entire life, bass fishing. So now we learn these things and you see these little subtle things. I feel like, like I was never a believer of scent. And then I've seen it to where it's mattered in scenarios now. And I've seen it to where like why it matters and like. And so those are things like, like little subtle things to me, especially fishing professionally at this level. Like if I can just get, get two bites a year more than I did, cause they trail it all the time. You, you get a hundred fish to trail your bait today. You might catch six of them. You know what I'm saying? Like that's just the facts behind it. So last question on the mayor here is I know you're not like, I think when we've talked to you before, you've said like, you're not a big paddle tail on the back of like bladed jigs type guy. Like I know you're a lot more straight tail guy. So how are you oftentimes throwing the mayor then? The only, so like I, I, I throw like on a, like I got a, a bladed, like a flashy swimmer, bladed swim bait jig head, which is like a BMC version of a flashy swimmer. Yep. Um, I like that a lot. Like that's, that's like one of my favorite ways to rig that around grass, that, especially that four inch. Um, I, I love to throw it on, on the, uh, the swim bait, the finesse, well, the hybrid swim bait jig head like that. I use like with the freeloader scenario wise, I love just throwing it like a ball head. Like that to me is like day in and day out. And then like when I'm fishing for small mouth, like I was up in like Erie this year, uh, throwing like a half ounce moon eye or three ounce moon eye with a three inch, you know, a finesse jig head, just winding around and like, hit the bottom line, wind, wind, you know, and then just lock up on it. So like it all just sort of depends on like the depth zone you're fishing it. Like, I mean, uh, the great thing about the mayor and any swim bait out there, you know, for the most part, is just, it's so easy to fish. Like anybody can pick it up, you rig it up, you put it out there, you cast, you let it hit the bottom, you wind, and you keep on moving. And, and it catches fish, and it really catches them, you know, from walleye to bass to every different kind of game fish. It does a good job of doing that. All right, we'll get back to our conversation with Jacob Wheeler in just a second. But first, we are brought to you in part by Dakota Lithium Batteries. Whether you have an $80,000 bass cat or you got a $2,000 tracker, whether you've got, I don't know, a kayak that's a $99 Sun Dolphin or you got a $5,000 Hobie or your electronics are a $70 Lowrance hook or $5,000 worth of forward-facing sonar, side scan, 360, whatever you got, you want to make sure that they're powered by the best. And for me, the best batteries in the game right now are Dakota Lithium Batteries. Dakota Lithium Batteries are twice the power of traditional batteries at half the weight. They charge up to five times faster. They last up to four times longer. They've got 100% U.S.-based customer support, and they come with a whopping 11-year warranty. So you can run the best batteries in the business with over a decade of warranty protection and make sure that your day on the water is never cut short. And right now, not only are we saving you battery weight, not only are we saving you headaches from your other underperforming batteries, we're also going to save you money. 
because that's what we do here at Tackle Talk. So you can go to www.dakotalithium.com and use code TACKLETALK10 to save 10% off your purchase just for listening to the show. So we recommend products we like, we work with brands we love, and we always try and save you money. So again, you can use code TACKLETALK10 over at www.dakotalithium.com, the official lithium battery of Bassmaster. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Jacob Wheeler. Good on the first one. That is the mayor. Let's move to the second one here, the freeloader. I know you have a soft spot for the freeloader. Obviously, Gunnersville this year uh, probably yeah. helps that a little bit and a nice check there. But as far as the freeloader goes, what was the reasoning behind putting this in your lineup of a pintail plastic, but a pintail plastic that, like you said, right, when you think of like a spunk shad, a spunk shad has that Kai tech body that you were talking about earlier, that rounded, ultra ribbed, all the way around type body that's not necessarily the true profile of a shad. And so you went with flat sides and a flat belly. So what purpose do both of those serve based on how you're fishing it? So like for me personally, of course, the number one way we were going to market the market at the time um, for the freeloader was, was a vibrating jig trailer. Um, You know, I, I knew I've been playing with a lot of baits and I knew that, like I've been catching them at Chikamaga. I've been catching them at a lot of different places and things have started transitioning to this. There's a little bit of you know, some anglers that were getting some understanding of what was going on with like more of that, whether it's a BOA rig or it's a Damiki, like you're, there's a little bit more to it than just that. It's there are a, a mid strolling. There's a lot of different terms for it. And so I secretly not even talking with like the guys, I'm secretly putting little attributes that I want in this bait, but also being able to make it really good for a chatter bait. I'm like, I want to make it really good for this because I will win a tournament one day or have multiple high finishes on this moving forward. But I just don't want to talk about it yet. And so that was sort of one that I was able to, to, and I, and I did that with a couple plastics within the lineup. There's little subtle things that I, I may not be marketed towards certain things, but I did certain things to make them for an, something else too. Like to do what I wanted to do here really good, but I was able to make something that, you know, while in the back of my mind, I want something for, and I have, so like, so that's sort of was the freeloader. So of course it works great on, 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 you know, a, a swim bay, you know, on a, on a, on a chatter bay, a spinner bay, you know, of course all that stuff. But um, the mindset with a freeloader for sure with, like that shake and bake mid strolling technique was I wanted those flat sides big time. That was a huge deal. Cause as that bait rolled, I wanted there to be more flash. Okay. You have a rounded body. It just sort of like rocks around. Right. I wanted there to be more flash as it sort of rolled. Now, like, of course I can like, and I think that's so interesting to me is so many people think that, you know, I'm casting that bait out there and just like, locking into my four fish and sonar and watching every fish eat it. You know, there were several fish I've caught doing that, but it's it's just literally a cadence and you figure it out and then it just gets heavy and you're just like, Zzz. it's like, it's like swim bait. I have caught them in two foot of water. I've caught them in 30 foot of water. And so it's like something that I've realized is such a powerful technique. Um, and I don't even think we've actually like cracked the surface on like how powerful that technique is. And like, there's going to be a lot of different places that goes from shallow water applications to to deep water applications all over. But um, that was like really a big part of it all. You know, that was a big part of it. I was probably say 50% of it. And of course, vibrating jig trailer, like to me, I've always been a big fan of a Lake Fork Magic Shad. Um, that's always been a great one for me. Um, and then like sort of, of course, like, uh, uh, and that was sort of like, you know, having that shad profile and doing something a little bit different. Um, Slimmer size it gave it a little bit more of that, like that action sort of like I'm, I'm again, a big on, on my vibrating jigs hunting. Like, you know, like I said, I don't really, I'm not a big fan of, of, of my using boot tails as much on, on, on a chatterbait. And so like, for me, that was another big reason behind that. I took this out today and I, we were talking about before we recorded that it was kind of a miserable day out, but I was out there fishing on the river and I had this just EWG just weightless and I was fishing it like a fluke. 
Yep. That's yeah. how I was out there fishing it. And it, it walks surprisingly well. It's got a pretty nice back and forth to it on just a weightless EWG hook. So like I said, I think the versatility of this thing is what's really cool is like you said, yes, obviously you look at it and you say, yep, that's a bladed jig trailer. That's something like that. But like you said, I, this strikes me more as a fluke than it does something like a smoke shad. I 100% agree with that. You know, I definitely agree with you on that. And that's something like, it's like, it's profile aspect of like more of a fluke style bait. And that was sort of the mindset of like, how do I merge like sort of on my mind, multiple different techniques in one. It, and that's hard to do, but that was sort of the mindset with that. And like, like to me, like I, it will work as a fluke. Like I'll put like a weighted hook on it and it'll actually like shimmy down, like slow, like, like almost like a Cinco will. Um, and there's just like little ways, you know, like having a smaller profile because it's like a four and a quarter and like a fluke five something or whatever. So like, that's sort of like something that I always have, like, Hey, if they're eating a little bit smaller bait or they're on a small, like thread fin, you know, I'll pull that out. And I've caught them definitely doing that as well. So it's just figuring out, like, I, I got to give everybody out there like, Hey, look, you got to take time to, to make, you know, play around with your tackle because you'll learn little things and understand like, Oh, wow. Like you know, with that freeloader, understand like a little weighted hook on there allows it to really, with that flat body, allows it to shimmy more, you know? So then I'm able to like make those casts, a little weighted hook, it shimmies more. I get what I needed to do and I pop, 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 pop. And it darts around a little bit more than shimmies just like a sink cast. Like, those are like, yeah, definitely something you can use it for. You mentioned with the mayor, I think too, the big hook cavities, you've got some pretty big flaps like on the bottom of this thing. And is that something that you usually look for? Like, it's one of those things I never really put a lot of stock in because I just tuck my hook points anyway. But is that something where you'll leave that hook like completely exposed and not tucked in the actual inside of the bait and just use that hook cavity to shield it? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's 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 definitely... You know, like when I go to like a hook cavity aspect, I want as least amount of plastic as I possibly can have to have to penetrate through from text stringing that bait or, you know, text posing that bait. So it's like, you know, to me, that's really the most important thing. I've even played around with that, with, uh, with the freeloader, with like, um, like a flashy swimmer or that, you know, the, 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 uh, hybrid swim bait jig head, um, with, and, and I, I've utilized that with a bladed hybrid swim bait. And that, and that works really well as well. Like it just sort of has that vibration. It sort of like shimmies around. If you want something a little bit more subtle, like little things like that, like I wanted that hook slot in there so I could, you know, of course text trigger, but then also add some other like screw locks and weighted hooks and stuff like that with it as well. So last thing on this one is the ribs itself. And I guess this is probably across the line is one of the things you look at when you look at each one of these baits, like you have this consistent and they're like the same distance apart too so you can tell like you can look that ribbing is kind of across the board for all five of these which is weird because i love rib baits too and a lot of my soft plastics have these deep ribs in them obviously you look at kytex and stuff like that and it's become very popular but what do you think it is about that texture because as you look like naturally around at forage like nothing has a really rough texture to that like everything they're eating is smooth sided yet we've found the success in these like ultra soft plastic rib baits is it just something that gives those fish you think something to feel in their mouth and like collapse on or what do you think the deal is with ribs in general so the the, um the real reason that i like that so much is because those ribs trap air and then when they get to the bottom or hit the bottom or i start like so like for for instance on a freeloader like when I make a cast, it'll trap air in those ribs. And then when it gets down there, I start working it. Like, say, a fish sees it, and I start working bubbles come up out of it. Or, like, with a bronco bug or with, like, like like all of those, the same scenario. It's, like, or with the, the BLT, same scenario. It traps air, and it hits the bottom. And if a fish falls out to the bottom, all those bubbles come up, and it's, like, a natural sort of, like, I've never in a million years thought of the bubbles that they would trap. But yeah, I mean, it's a good point. You're right. If you've got something, especially that got ribs on the bottom side that it's falling, then yeah, even if it's on the way down, like it's going to have air under it that might release bubbles as you go. And you can probably, I don't know how sensitive, you know, forward facing is, but you, sometimes you can see bubble trails and stuff off of baits. Yeah. I don't know about like that. I, I mean, I only know it just because of like in testing, I was able to look at that. I'm like, uh, that we're, keep, we're keeping that. And then that's really cool. Let's use this a little bit more. That's why, like, guys, I sort of played around with it, like, a little bit more. That was something that I was like, yep, we're going to, that just adds a little bit more. If it adds something, I'm like, yeah, we can keep that. That sounds like a good idea. I like yeah. that. It adds <laughs> a little bit more to it. 
All right, next up on the list, we have the cleanup crawl. So the cleanup crawl is, it's like your standard three and a half inch, more traditional of the two crawls that you came out with, obviously. You got your flat sides, you've got your flanges on both sides of the appendage there, and then you've got these three small like appendages on either side as they go down. One of the design elements that strikes you on this and then on, I believe, the Bronco Bug, we'll probably get to in a second too, those three appendages that you have on either side of it are faced the complete opposite way that almost every other bait that you're going to see down the aisles is. Like every bait has those little arms pointed toward the back of the bait the way the water's going, and you've got these three little appendages that are pointed the opposite way. I think I know the reason for that, but I have to imagine that was intentional, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was definitely intentional. Like, I, you know, there's, there's obviously like a, like a, you know, there's, there's the primary action in a bait, and then there's secondary actions in a bait that again can can make a difference in generating bites. And so, for me, it's like those little subtle things that can really, you know, trigger a fish. Or so, like with with the cleanup crawl, it was the same. It was like that inverted leg. Like when you every little movement that I pull that bait, of course, it just goes back and it just quivers. It's quivering nonstop. So like even a little current comes by, it's quivering. It's it just, it's really sensitive to that. And then, like to my mind, like I made it big enough where that it would quiver and it would get that good secondary action, but not too big where it would negatively impact someone fishing in heavier cover. Like, so I had to think of that as well. Like I don't want to like, but I wanted something to add a little bit more to the bait. And I always thought, I'm like, well, you know, it was on, like, why does everybody do it this way? And as I would review and I think about stuff and I'm like, man, like I look at them in the pool, like other baits in the pool. And I'm like, those things, they're literally do nothing. And I'm like, how can we just do something that's like, do this guys, just try this. And it's like, oh, wow. That's like, you know, that's really cool. Um, and so that was really the mindset of that secondary action, every little movement, even if those crawls aren't moving, like you just pop it just a, I mean, a tiny bit, those little, you know, those little appendages on the side, they're just, they're quivering a little bit. And so like, whether it's a fish spawning or a fish is sitting there looking at like, I don't know if that's real. Those are the things that I really looked at. And I'm like, that, that really was something that I was like, Hey, that can also separate us in the crawl, the crawl game a little bit. Cause it is, you know, everybody has a crawl out there. And so that was definitely, you know, that was something that I really wanted to, I was, I, you know, I was like, Hey, we got to do this. Yeah. I was seeing it. Like I was flipping it and you would see like they flare up as it falls down. And I think that's honestly, if I had the like gun to my head, I would say my favorite thing about that cleanup crawl is just the straight down fall of it. You guys did a really good job with the consistent motion. I've, I've thrown it on three sixteenths. I've thrown it on three eights. It doesn't matter. You get that nice flutter. It's not obnoxious it's not a rage crawl yeah it's it's somewhere in the middle and you get that just clean back and forth and then those three little appendages on the side flare up as it goes down because you look at something like uh i don't know like an exone adrenaline crawl or something like it's got those spines on the side too but they're faced the opposite way and they're so small they're just part of the profile they don't actually add action or anything they're just part of the overall shape Absolutely. of the bait and so i think you guys again did a good job on thinking through these things that are usually useless and just part of what makes it look different in the package than the other three that are down the aisle. And you're like, no, how can we, as it hits the bottom and they quiver as soon as it hits the bottom too, like as it hits yeah. the bottom, your, Stop. your claws do a good job. The claws start to fall. And then these things just kind of like do that and they just yep. poke out a little bit and they flare. So I do like it. I think it's still nice, you know, reeling it in. It's still nice hopping it and stuff, but I think I've really found that I like this crawl on like the straight down the best. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that. Like that to me, like really the design on like the bottom side of it was really more so the consistent action of like that I wanted. Like I'm like, I needed to like you said, like a three sixteenths, like for my Ohio River guy throwing an eighth and a three sixteenths, and then the guys who are, you know, throwing a, a normal three eighths, you know, you want you know, it's a lot easier to make that three your three eighths work with any crawl, but a three sixteenths, you put it out there and it still it still kicks consistently. Um, but again, even sort of going with the swim bait, same sort of deal. Like I didn't want it to be too aggressive. Like you sort of said, like it needed to be like a little bit, like if I can make it tighter, I, you know, I, I would. And so that was sort of like the perfect, that was sort of the middle ground. There was a, there's a, a version of it that was even tighter than that. And I'll even go like when I, like actually, so like what I did was I'll even go in, like when I use it on a jig trailer and I don't want as much action, I'll cut the back half of the appendage off, like the back little flange. To where it has a little tight, has a little bit more tight 
Like, so it's like, you know, it has more of like a, I don't know, I wouldn't say like, it, it's not, it's definitely like you said, not right, a rage crawl. It's way under that, but it's, it's consistent. It has good little tight action, but it can be even tighter. And so, but I, so I cut off like the back end of that, that flange, and then I'll use it where I want like faster, like a faster fall, like that back end. On each side, I'll cut that off, right. and then that'll have it a little bit more tight. It won't be as consistent of an action, but that will give me a different action than what's actually there. Or if I want a faster fall, like a quarter ounce weight or something like that, I can I, I sort of play around with that, especially the jig trailer. But I also wanted that crawl for a swim jig, and a swim jig needs resistance. So I need resistance up there to where I could really pump it. I might do that Alabama shake and shake it through there. I wanted a little bit more profile there as well. Cause I all, you know, a lot of complaints out there. They're like, man, I, I only get one bite out of a, you know, out of a bait, not saying you won't get it one bite out of a bait. It happens at times, but consistently, I don't want to make a product that I only a one fish bait. If I can help it. I mean, you know, it, it, so that was sort of the mindset, like thickness. I wanted something that had a little bit of thicker body. I could cut it down. I wanted it to where I could use it in super versatile. And the cross the key bait to be a super versatile bait. And that's why like, I made it, you know, in, in, in those scenarios. You tell me if you did this on purpose or not, too. So I was cutting this the other day and I was putting it on a finesse jig. And where you cut, obviously, like usually you cut out about half of this thing, right? And usually like secondary appendages like that go all the way up the bait. And with yours, they stop about halfway up. So if I cut this and I trim this for a finesse jig, all six of those secondary appendages are still on the bait. Yeah, so that that's uh, that's that's sort of my mindset of like that. I'm not gonna say that was intentional necessarily. Like I'm like it had to be that way. It was something that as I played around with it, like I like these appendages here. This is where I get the best action. And I'm like, hey, look, also guys, this is really where I'm gonna cut it in half to make it for a swim jig trailer or a smaller jig trailer, you know, this is where I'm going to majority of the time I'm going to cut it and I'm going to still have that secondary action. That's awesome. So next we have obviously the Bronco bug and the Bronco bug. It's a shape that I guess if you're really dialed into like JDM stuff, people have seen that type of shape before, but as far as like mass produced on your local store shelves, like there were probably a lot of people that hadn't really seen anything quite like that or until they saw the entire internet, you know, light up and yeah. be like, Oh, I've known about this for years. No, you haven't. You, yeah. you, you, you weren't throwing a doe live beaver. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like that kind of stuff. So it's a really cool action on this bait and two types of action. Like I like the fact that when you flip something like a Bronco bug, you've got this, like, as soon as it hits the bottom, those giant meaty inverted appendages, just, they like, there's like secondary and third dairy i don't know like motion <laughs> as they hit the the ground and quiver and then also yeah. on the straight retrieve i don't know why it does it i don't know how it does it but those type of appendages make this thing just like dolphin donkey kick in the water yeah, and it's really sure. weird so of all of the creature baits because you said you wanted like a creature bait in this five of something mm -hmm. uh to round out the five lineup here why did you go with the inverted type deal here versus more of like uh the sweet beaver or something like that, like that you see those normal shapes. Yeah. So like, you know, for me, it really came down, like, like you said, like it, it, as I'm looking at like creature baits, I'm like, everything sort of has been done. Right. And I'm looking at things and I'm looking at the market and looking at where I'm at. And I'm like, I've used like a OSP beaver before I've used that several times and I always had issues with it. Like I couldn't, it was a really good bait on a free rig. It was like more of a finesse tactic bait. I've also used a Nori's um, bug that that actually was the original with the action. They made the action of that. Is that the Chiba something or whatever I they called it? I think it's Chiba or something. I just, I, I just Twin, something like that. Yeah. That's what it is. So they were the originator of the action that I know of. You know, there's so many different things. I even went and talked to, to several, you know, friends there, you know, from, from Japan and asked them, like, who was first? What was up? Like, what's the thoughts? Because there's always something like, even like with a cover scat, supposedly a cover scat was not first. G crack was actually first <laughs> to the mark. So there's always some, yeah, like, I'm always, always trying to understand, like, you know, so, um, cause you obviously like, like to me, this is the one that I legitimately, I'm like, I look at it and I love that action. So like, of course, every time I've talked about it, I'm like, look, you know, shout out to Norris and OSP. Cause I thought it was a phenomenal action. I thought like, look, but I couldn't do what I wanted to do 
with either of those baits. And so that's where I'm like, all right, if I could do something and add like more of a heavy cover bug, bigger profile, but add extra action, have that sort of that dolphin kick like those two baits have, I could do something sort of unique and it won't cost everybody $10.99. You can't get them. That's one tough thing about JDM products. You can't get them a lot of times. And so they are tougher. They're typically more of a finesse mindset tactic, like minded techniques or baits. They're softer. They're one fish baits at best a lot of times. And so how can I create something that's going to be more, I'm going to be more efficient with, more durable, also be able to fish in heavier cover, put a bigger hook in. All of those things were in my mindset when I did that. Like that was really the goal. And so like it, when I was sort of developed, I'm like, I want, but I also want those secondary actions. I want somebody to get more out of that bait where I could ultimately have like the raised ribs on each side. Like it, it's all about functionality and it was all about efficiency for me out there on the water that like when I look at the Bronco bug, why I created it the way I did. Yeah. And I think for, again, 95% of normal anglers out there that are listening to this right now, you hit the nail on the head. It's no longer a one fish bait. I've only used a OSP beaver one time and you're right. Like those big, when you have that much meat on either side of that small thing that's connecting that giant claw to the giant yeah. body, like they're going to rip and it's going to yeah. happen. So that, and then the fact that I think they're like anywhere from 11 to 12 bucks a pack and you only get like five or six of them in a pack and you got to send a carrier pigeon over to Japan for it because no <laughs> one over here has got them in stock for the past two years. So it's like bringing something like that to the masses, to the kid or, you know, the person here in Ohio that would have never in a million years had a chance at fishing a $12 for six pack of soft plastics that hasn't been in stock in two years. Like yeah. that's what I love about this kind of stuff. I never understand why more options is a bad thing to people. Yeah, I, I understand that too. Like, And I would never take the, the credit for the action. And that's why I always make sure to preface that because I'm like, that was something that was originated here. And this is where I'm going to tell you where it was originated at because I respect that. I don't, but I will never make something again that I feel like, again, like you're like that I can't do something better or I can sort of find a hole or a niche in, 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 the, in fishing world that I feel like this is where this is going to fit. And this is going to do a lot better for this. That's my goal. Cause again, it's so hard. There's some things that I have coming out that I definitely am excited about that are really unique, but I had, I, it was just, you know, that, that one right there, it's uh it's a special bait that that Bronco bug catches them. And it is something that a lot of people aren't, they don't really, you know, it, they don't see it and say, okay, this bait does that. They don't understand it yet. So it'll take some time for it to catch on for sure. Yeah. It's one of those baits. When you look at it, you go, that thing's not going to have any action. Like, You're like how? it's got, it's got no flanges. It's got no reason for anything to move on it. And then you put it under the water and it starts free willy in. And you're like, what the heck is this thing doing? Um, it's super cool. How did you guys tackle the issue of trying to solve the durability problem with that type of shape? Because like I said, just physics wise, when you got that much meat on either side of that small little arm, it's definitely got to be a tough issue to try and solve to say, how do we make this more durable? It's still never, it's never going to be the most durable thing in the world, not, just because of how it's, it's designed. It's not. it's not. And it's also like that, that bait has to have a lot of salt in it. The salt content has to be pretty heavy to make it that way. And, and so that to me was like, it took a while to get, to get the right action. Also, I made it like we have like the, like the Bronco kick. The reason it got the name Bronco bug was literally because it was, um, when we, we had a different, I said, Hey, like, can we thin up the connection a little bit, which it looks pretty thin. Like, and, and so I, can we thin that up a little bit and see what that does? Um, when I got it back, you know, Kyle Wood, Dan Quinn, the whole crew were all sit there and we pitch it in, the, in, in a tank. Um, and when it hit the bottom, it literally had like a doll, it had like a Bronco kick. So it hits the bottom and because those legs are so heavy and then that, depend, that, that hinge right there isn't really thick. Those legs come forward because it's so weight heavy and then they come back. So it gives that sort of defensive crawfish motion when it hits the bottom. And that was the moment I'm like, all right, let me fish this for like a month and let me see how many fish rip the dang claws off. And so it was like, I mean, as far as it was a 90, the high 90% that I never had a claw come off. And I'm like, 
this is the version we need to roll with because that adds this and it adds this and we have a thicker body and we have secondary action with inverted appendages. This is the one for me. So here's the big question then. When you have two craw type plastics in these five, when are you picking up a Bronco bug versus a cleanup crawl? So like a Bronco bug still is like, even though it's like that undulating action crawfish action, I it has more of a bluegill profile as well. Um, also, one thing that a bronco bug's really, really good at is because it has so much weight to it and so much plastic, it's a really good weightless bait like that you can skip on a bait caster. Um, sort of like almost like a cover scat, but something different that you can skip underneath a dot on a 7.3 medium heavy with a, like a fast tip that have a lot of backbone on 17 pound line and a four aught straight shank hook. Like that was another thing that I'm like, all right, this is going to, you know, completely different deal, you know, but like you skip it there and it sort of sits like it horizontally, like almost like that, like Cinco ish deal. And then when you pull it, it, was, it flutters. So like that was definitely um, something that like, you know, it, they're just two different profiles, you know, and they, and they hold like I'm flipping a Bronco bug by itself more. Like I would say 50, 50 on the cleanup crawl. It's sort of an addition to on some things um, on mo- half my techniques. Like obviously football jig trailer, regular jig. Um, I can adjust things like a little bit accordingly to what I want it to do. Of course, a great little punch bait. It's, it's the right profile. Really good. Just pitching around by itself. It's not too small where you can't pitch it around by itself. Works great on a Carolina rig. Like I had multiple different things in my mindset. Like this is like, uh, like this is like your seven foot medium heavy in a prize. Yeah. Like it's going to do it a lot. It's going to do a lot. Where the Bronco bug, it's more so like, hey, different action, showing the fish a different action in different scenarios. And there's some other techniques within this profile that I'm adding to it, like a weightless rig because it's so heavy that I'm able to utilize this for that separates it, you know, and that's was like, they're different. Like it still can be a bluegill imitator. It can still be a crawfish imitator, but just that profile overall, four inches long, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, wider. It, it just catches them. I've caught them when I know they're eating bluegills and I'm pitching like a bluegill colored Bronco bug around and they're, you know, gobbling it up. I've seen it happen. You know, it's, it's just, sometimes it's just showing them something different with action can be the difference in generating the bite. All right, we'll get back to our conversation with Jacob in just a second. But first, we are brought to you in part by Arctic. Arctic coolers are my favorite coolers on the market for two specific reasons. One, they never let me down and they perform just how they're supposed to every single time. And two, they're half the price of the other guys. So the same or better quality at half the price to me is a win-win. And right now, they've got their final sale of the season going on on the website where you can save 10% off select hard coolers, up to 30% off select soft coolers and drinkware, and up to 40% off bags and apparel. So whether you need a hard cooler for the boat, you need a soft cooler for the kayak, a new coffee mug for your morning commute, an insulated tote for grocery trips, Arctic has you covered, and you can head over to www.rticoutdoors.com to check out their final sale of the season and save big on your favorite coolers and drinkware from our great partners over at Arctic. Again, that's www.rticoutdoors.com. Keep the adventure going with Arctic. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Jacob Wheeler. So that leads us to the final bait here. And I know of all the work that probably went into these, I know you're probably not going to hear it. This is probably my favorite one, to be honest. I (laughs) just, obviously it's a necessity of where I live too, but it's definitely the one that I have fallen in love with the past like probably two three weeks more so than i probably anticipated even and it is the ned blt and so the ned blt i think might be the most different from all of them obviously you're dealing with a completely different plastic here so you've got that what tpe that thermoplastomic elastomer or something yeah yeah yeah. so whatever tpe stands for i'll let the chemists decide that one but it's like from what i know about tpe which isn't much i think it's got a different melting point than like our normal soft plastic so i have to imagine like even in the engineering side of things like it's got to be a different process to make this probably than the other four in the lineup so first question here why TPE? Why did you go with a different formula and a different actual type of plastic for this bait in particular and not so much the other four? 
Okay, so like this one definitely came in like thinking about like mindset wise. Um, I love throwing like I, you think of like the original Ned, like in Z Man Ned. It was like, of course, like a last text. Like that was something that was always great. It worked really well. I used it a lot over the years. Um, but I wanted a profile a little bit different. Like when you think of like a, that traditional Ned style bait, you think of like stubby, um, Pacinko style, like Ned Katie, like he, that's what his mindset was. Um, not much action, but with action lists. Um, so like I sort of went a different position, still had some floating material to it and it was, it would float. Um, but would float about an eighth ounce head or maybe a, like a right around an eighth. But like once it got heavier than that. So to me, like, I'm like, all right, I want something that's a little bit more narrow that has a little bit of action because it's more of a narrowed worm type of bait. Um, I want it to be a little bit longer to where it's not just locked in to maybe like, so it's three inches, not like 2.75, which is not a lot, but it is just a little bit more, more of a taper. Of course, those ridges that allow it to trap the air. And then that catches the air. When it hits the bottom, that air sort of comes up. Um, and then of course I wanted it to where it was a high floating plastic and that, that plastic right there with the amount of salt that I have in it, it will literally stand up a quarter ounce jig head. Like I literally did like a, a test on it. Like, cause like, I'm a big fan of like a, of a TRD as well. Like, I mean, big, big shout out to them. I um, mean, Z man, like I know them for a long time, but like it was, I've thrown a lot of quarters. I throw heavy, I throw like a lot of three sixteens. And so for me, you never got that advantage typically with that plastic you know of course it's, it's also super durable but like that the high floating plastic to me i wanted it to stand up those heavier heads because that's what i throw on tour you know and and that's where i what i did with it like the 316 it will stand instantly and it's awesome for like a quarter ounce jig like now a quarter ounce jig i put it on the back of a quarter ounce jig throw it out there like finesse jig cut, cut it up real super tight boom straight up like those are the things that really were like my mindset different. But in addition to that, I'm a big fan of throwing like that bait on a drop shot. So whether I'm throwing it drop shot where I'm wacky rigging it or throwing a crossover ring in the center of it, where it'll sit, it's the only bait that I know of that will sit perfectly horizontal on the market. Texas, well, not the only bait. I'm sure there's some, some up there, but personally that I've thrown where you rig it per, you know, like that. And you have that, you have a rig it wacky style or like a, or just rig it straight through it, wacky style and throw it out there. It'll sit perfectly horizontal, you know, it's right there in the center of the bait. So like, I can just, I can literally have like a 12 inch leader or 14 inch leader. And it's just sitting right there above that perfectly horizontal every time. I was going to ask you if you ever uh, drop shot this, because is the secondary thing that I thought of as soon as you see it is like, this would be a killer drop shot bait. I don't drop shot a ton, but for, the people that do would be great. The one thing I think I want to give like praise to this. I don't know the right word for it, but you harnessed that like durability and the type of plastic you want, but you increased the jiggliness of that type Actually, of plastic. Yeah. Cause like, you, cause like you said, I got a, a TRD right here and a TRD by design is stubby and motionless. And that's like, as soon as it hits the bottom, it just kind of sits there. And then you've got this more, it's not a, a, a pintail obviously, but it comes to more of a point as it goes up and it narrows. And it does like, I've seen it underwater where you sit it there. And I think one of the things I look for sometimes in Ned's is the ability to have that bait continue moving when I'm doing nothing to it. Absolutely and right. That's the tough part. Like there are certain times where I want to like on my end dead stick that bait, but I don't want that bait to be acting like a dead stick under the water. I want it to just have just that little tiny bit of motion that that fish that's nosed on it for the last 24 seconds says, <laughs> all right, it's still moving where with a, you know, a Z-Man TRD or something, once it sits there, it's just basically sitting there. Like it's not really yeah. doing a whole lot. So I really like that. I like that it's just got this momentum to it that once it starts moving, moving and you can like if you're watching this like you can see, it's just way more jiggly than i think any other of those <laughs> ultra stretchy like you think like a nico baits or something like that right yeah. those really durable type stretchy neds they're by design not having a lot of secondary motion to them no and they don't and, that, and that's what like that was definitely like the differentiator it's really hard to change um and separate yourself in the worm markets <laughs> and, yeah. and like that so so like that 
little bit of you know change and you know like we even talked about at iCast having those in a clamshell every single bait that you have that you get out of those you know each crush city bo- or bag it literally is straight every time you're paying for premium plastic but you're get, every single bait is ready to roll it's not kinked up it's not you know it's a, it's it's a legitimate it's, it's it's ready to roll it's tournament ready it's what i'm gonna put in my box and i'm gonna you know i'm gonna, I'm gonna put on my on my bait and like it's ready to roll it's so, like that's that's important to me. I remember Aaron Martin's always being ate up with it. Like, you know, and, and, um, always really looked up to a, a Martin, man. He's just, he's unbelievable, but he was super meticulous in every single bait that he would pull out of a package. I remember him bringing a pack of, of, of flukes and, and, and he was picking them out one by one. And he's like, man, he'd go through like 10 packs and he had like seven flukes. And there'd be like, or six or six, 16 worms out of like 30, you know, 30 packs. And I'm like, why, man, it matters. It all matters. And so I, I always, that always stuck with me, you know? And so like, um, you know, to, to, to take a little extra and, and put those in clamshells, you know, especially you wouldn't think a worm makes that big a difference, but obviously it really does. And, uh, I think a lot of people do that with every, you know, a lot of, a lot of other plastics out there with cross and everything else. But when you don't have appendages, it still really matters and still definitely impacts the, uh, the, the overall action of the bait and the overall look of the bait. Yeah, that's definitely the thing that grinds my gears, right? And you're in the price range with these that you're about a dollar a bait, which is basically normal nowadays. But the thing is, it grinds my gears when you pay a dollar a bait. And like you said, three of the seven in there come with crimped claws. And, you know, I get it all the time because I buy cheap baits a lot of times. You're like, I can't use half of these. Like, even if I wanted to overlook the small issues like there's still half these in the bag that have been sitting with their claws like this for three months and no matter what you do boil them whatever it's not going to matter they're not coming back to life <laughs> i know it's so frustrating oh my like, gosh dang i mean there's yeah it, it, it it's it's something that you just you have to um you appreciate you appreciate it but i mean i was the same way like i remember i still have packages of baits that i used to have back when i was like in high school you know and i'm like gosh and i opened them up the other day and i'm like all right, it's time to time to get rid of these. <laughs> so on the Ned BLT itself, can you explain to me again, is it just something that looks cool or was there any rhyme or reason? Because I'm a dork and I ask questions like this, but that little almost like turtle shell type turtle, deal. Turtle, yeah, that's like worm. Yeah, that's right up at the top there. What was the reason behind that in the design process, like in the mold versus just saying no, I'm just doing a, a ribbed worm all the way down? So, so the only reason I did that working with engineers, I wanted it to dart around a little bit more. And so I didn't want it to completely have resistance, you know? Okay. Um, so I wanted, so like it basically has like the top of the worm sort of like comes up and it sort of has a raised portion there that it sort of goes down the sides. And so that sort of gave it a little bit more when I rigged that hook, the, you know, that's where I, that's the top of the, the, the worm. When I rig it there, it sort of glides more because of that, but still has the ribs to allow it to sort of, you know, with the bubbles. So that was sort of my mindset with that. It's so funny because Welcher, Welcher, when we were talking about, like, I would, I would, I'd work, I'd talk to Welcher a lot. And like, and he's like, it's the turtle back worm. That's what you need to call it, the turtle back worm. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, it's just funny. It's like, that turtle back worm catches them. Like, shut up, Welcher. You know what it is. The turtle back worm. The turtle back worm. I love that you mentioned like the gliding of it, because when we had Ned on, obviously, and talking to Ned about like the olden days when they were first starting to do this. And Ned will tell you he's not the guy that invented the Ned rig. He just kind of like wrote about it. And obviously that's where people picked it up. But there's like seven different cadences or whatever that he fishes a net like and one of them is like the the swim and glide or whatever, like that type of deal where he's fishing him in the middle of the water column on like the lightest jig head he can find. And he's like, it's not always meant to just go all the way down to the bottom real fast and stand straight up. Like it's what it does in the meantime that's a big deal with the Ned rig. And I think we've lost that a lot of times now. It's just people putting a jig head on to get it straight down to the bottom and they're just bulldozing the bottom with a rock or whatever. That BLT is a bait. That was one of the baits that I made that has multiple different things that I have in my back pocket that are really, 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 really good. And it does some things differently than any other base in the market because of that. It obviously does it just really well on a net, but it does it way on a drop shot. But there's other things that I made it for that I was like. Where's the BLT name come from? That was just more so Dan Quinn. He he loves he loves a BLT. He loves a, <laughs> a bacon lettuce tomato sandwich. And I was just so funny. We were laughing. I'm like, what's called the Ned BLT? Ned BLT, Ned BLT. And he's like, 
yeah, I love it. And we were just <laughs> laughing about it. So it was just sort of more so like an inside joke within the crew. And everybody loved, uh, you like BLTs, Kyle? Yeah, I do. I love BLT. Bath, like that. I was just called the BLT. And, you know, it was just funny. That was really it, that was the 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 fun the fun the fun reason. I wish I could tell you it was man. There was a lot of there was the scientific reason of why we call it the BLT. But no. yeah, I was picturing like you some cheeky little like bass love texture or something yeah, like that. Like exactly. like, <laughs> nah, what? just some guy on the design process really loves BLTs. <laughs> <laughs> like legitimately. <laughs> It was pretty funny. Well, I got one last question for you here, and it is it's actually from a listener. So I posed out uh, to a couple listeners before we started recording here if they wanted to ask you a question. This was the best one that came in. So this is the mailbag question powered by Dakota Lithium, and it is from Tyler. And he says, I know we might not get a straight answer, but can you ask Jacob Wheeler if there are any plans to continue this line and expand down the road, or are they happily sticking with five? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, I've been working diligently um with the next run of crush city baits it's it's uh i'm excited i'm excited to, to there's some things that definitely um again you know there's some things that are you know 20 30 percent increase and really nice but there's also some things i'm looking forward to to to, to, to show and why and, and what it does and what it does differently so yeah there's uh, there's definitely there's some more coming yeah every every year right now like we're working on 2025 right now so we already have 24 done. Um, and then I'm working, I'm finalizing colors right now. So I'm finalizing okay. the color line, which is interesting, which is a lot of fun too. But like, you know, little things of like somebody was like, I commented on, on my post and by the Bronco bug. And he's like, I wish you wouldn't make your green pumpkin so dark. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I like a dark green pumpkin. I, I, I want like black I, in my green pumpkin. <laughs> like I want it darker green pumpkin than light. I don't want it watermelon. Like that's no. not, I, I want a green pumpkin. Like I'm in the, I lived in the Midwest. So like water's not that clean. Like it right. seems like all the people that love like the, like that natural watermelon -y, like green pumpkin or all like a, a lot of West coast guys, a lot of clear water guys, like a, you know, yeah. clean green pumpkin, but no, you actually like watermelon. Yeah. Th that's what watermelon <laughs> is for. Don't watermelon my green pumpkin. Just because that's exactly you like <laughs> what I was saying. I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of these people just need to fish some real dirty knee deep, sewage creeks and you know they'll learn that, like you need the dark you gp you don't have to throw black and blue if you have a dark green pumpkin I'm just telling Amen. you it's natural <laughs> catches them it's the natural color of the crawfish it's good yeah that's what i've always said crawfish don't turn black and blue when the water gets dirty like that's they fact. still find natural colored crawfish it is weird though in like louisiana they have like black and red craw crawfish yeah. quite a few of them like it is weird. Like they catch a lot. Like, so there is some, like, I'm not like a huge fan of like black neon, but there's buddies of mine that swear up and down. That is love. That's all they feel like black neon, black. Neon. I'm like, why? Oh, well, dude, our crawfish are this. And that's why like. I'm like, huh? Okay. I can roll with that. Well, Hey, I appreciate your time, man. And I'm again, I'm not blowing smoke. I think I told you before we started recording, I like these soft plastics. Like they have made their way into my day bag that I'm taking with me to the rivers, to the lakes. And it's not just to try out anymore. Like I'm past that phase in it. Now it's like, no, these are starting to replace two or three things in my <laughs> bag. And I think it's awesome. I mean, you guys did a great job. It was thoughtful. I think I love the protection of the integrity of the baits. I like the fact that you took ideas that are out there and genuinely improved on them or taking something like the freeloader and marrying a fluke and a spunk shadow. I like that you took something like an inverted craw and tried to fix the glaring issues that are out there with the two inverted craws that I think people might be lucky to get their hands on if they get their hands on them. So that kind of stuff. You guys did a really good job with these. And again, I think it's something that actually has staying power. And in a world where it seems like everybody's just making something for the headline for this year at ICAST and then they move on and those things aren't staples three, four, five years down the road, I think these really are the real deal. So kudos to you guys in Rapala. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate, I appreciate you trying them out, man. I, I, it's, uh, it's really cool, man. I, I know, I know it's been cool to sort of see through people and people, you know, comments and, and DMS and people talking about like, you know, Hey man, I just won my tournament last week on this and talking to some of like, you know, some of the, the, the smaller retailers that I, of course, people at Academy as well. And just sort of hearing this, you know, some of that, Hey man, people are excited about this and trying them out. And, you know, success stories, really success stories are really what it's all about to me. Like, Knowing that there people are going out there and catching fish and doing that, that's um, 
I would never have thought that in a million years, being a kid from Indiana, that I, that 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 this day would come. So it's really a, a, it's definitely, it's surreal. You sort of just sit back and you're like, I just made, I just sat here and worked with it's the best lure company in the world. I feel like, you know, of course, you know, and and uh, yeah, so it's, it, it is, it's very humbling. So thank, thank you for the kind words, man. Yeah, congrats on the launch. It's exciting to see them getting in people's hands, and we're uh, excited to see hopefully the population of Crush City continue to grow here in the next couple of years. I got, I got, I got a couple of good ones for you guys next year. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. See you, man. Better. All right, everybody, that is our complete breakdown of the brand new Rapala Crush City Custom Soft Plastics with the designer himself, Jacob Wheeler. And a quick reminder, if you want to go watch this conversation, complete with visuals and the entire interview, everything, it is available right now on our YouTube channel. So you can just go search Tackle Talk Bass Fishing Podcast. We should pop right up. Go subscribe because I'm going to try and do a little bit more of this in 2024 with the video in addition to the MP3 format. Won't do it every week, but for certain things like this, I do want to have a video element for you guys to watch. So go subscribe to the YouTube. Go check out our full interview with Jacob there as well. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope you enjoy hearing from Jacob in what I think might either be the only long form conversation or at least probably the longest to date in terms of a full breakdown of these baits with Jacob. And you guys know we have no sponsors in the bait game. Nothing is sent to us for free. I paid for these baits at the store just like you guys do. And I really think they're solid soft plastics that are going to be around for a while. I have a particular soft spot for the Ned BLT. Then I'd say probably the Freeloader and the Cleanup Crawl are my next two. And then the Bronco Bug is a cool bait for you guys that do a lot more largey fishing and power flipping and things like that. And the Mayor is just a solid all-around swim bait to give you guys an alternative to that power kick that some of those more aggressive swim baits have. So overall, I like these, which is why I asked Jacob to come on and give us more details about them. And I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. So that is today's episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. Next week, I'll actually be flying out of state to do a little research and a little bit of recon on a brand in particular and some new baits that I think they have coming out. So that could be really cool. We might have a sneak peek at that in next week's episode, hopefully if everything goes well. And as always, thank you guys so much for listening. I appreciate y'all. Go check us out on our website, tackletalkpodcast.com. Shoot us an email, tackletalkpodcast at gmail.com. Find us on social media at Tackle Talk Podcast, and we'll see you right back here next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Tackle Talk. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.